Hi, this is Kristen Huntoon. This is the Congress of Neurological Surgeons Neurosurgery 100, and today we'll be discussing glioma biology. This is quite a large topic, so I've included the PMI D of each publication in the, in the slide for your reference. So let's get started. Gliomas, and we're going to be spending most of the time talking about glioblastomas, are the most common adult primary brain tumor and are unfortunately incredibly aggressive, relatively resistant to therapy, and have a corresponding poor survival. They typically appear as a heterogeneous mass centered in the white matter with irregular peripheral enhancement, central necrosis, and surrounding vasogenic type edema, which in fact usually contains infiltration by neoplastic cells. Brain tumors of all cancers in particular are heterogeneous at the single cell level and organized in a hierarchical structure composed of cells by varying cell states. Genetic alterations, signaling alterations, metabolic alterations, and microenvironmental conditions converge to dictate an epigenetic landscape of individual cells. This landscape in turn defines cell state and influences cell signaling, metabolism, and the microenvironment even in the, genetic, the same genetic landscape. Molecular alterations within cancer cells promote cancer growth, but multiple deregulated pathways may converge to create an oncogenic epigenome. An altered epigenome that may lock cells into a stem-like state, inhibiting normal differentiation. From an evolutionary perspective, the divergent development of subpopulations of cancer cells within the same tumor is likely at the root of therapy failures, the development of treatment resistance, and ultimately recurrence of the malignancy. Subclonal populations in primary glioblastoma escape therapy and give rise to treatment refractory heterogeneous recurrent glioblastoma. After a normal cell acquires mutations, it expands into multiple subclonal populations of glioblastoma with selectable traits against any stress, including therapy. The administration of therapy for primary glioblastoma leads to the selection of subclone cell populations or gives rise to therapy-driven resistant subclones. These treatment refractory subclone populations then seed tumor relapse and lead to formation of heterogeneous recurrent glioblastoma that is distinct from clonal composition from the primary glioblastoma. Brain tumor initiating cells have shown to give rise to some of the cellular subpopulations within the tumor, including endothelial cells, but not immune infiltrates, which may arise from bone marrow macrophages or brain resident microglia. As mentioned, a great source of heterogenea in, in the tumor environment is in the abundance of parenchymal cells, such as vascular cells, microglial cells, peripheral immune cells, and neural precursor cells. Recently, we have shown by single cell sequencing, shown here in a UMAP, that myeloid cells those being microglia and bone marrow-derived macrophages, form the largest stromal compartment in gliomas. And this is not with extra supermarginal resection, but just of the tumor itself. From the first microscopic observations to the latest studies in gene expression, various classifications have been made in order to achieve a better understanding of this disease. Traditionally, GBMs have been separated into primary and secondary GBMs, shown here. Although there were recognizably clinical differences between these two subtypes, it wasn't until 1996 that they were histopathologically distinguished to be different. Now we know that there, these two major subclasses carry distinct genetic alterations that is used as a criterion for patient stratification and prognosis. The vast majority of GBMs arise de novo in older patients without clinical or histological evidence of a less malignant precursor lesion. They are so-called primary GBMs. Secondary GBMs arise from lower grade gliomas, diffuse astrocytomas, or anaplastic astrocy astrocytomas. They appear in younger patients and have a lower degree of necrosis, are usually located in the frontal lobe, and their prognosis is significantly better than that of primary GBMs. Histologically, primary and secondary GBMs are practically indistinguishable. They differ in their genetic and epigenetic profiles, as seen here. The molecular-based classification of gliomas just started around 20 years ago starting with the microarrays, but was ignited by the Cancer Genome Atlas. Glioblastoma was the first cancer subtype to be 
systematically studied by the Cancer Genomic Atlas Research Network called TCGA. Large effort, it was a large effort in multiple countries carried out in a comprehensive molecular characterization utilizing both histology, genetic, and molecular marker, markers, revolutionizing glioma classification. We can see that this led to multiple classification schemes. Initially, it was the proneural proliferation in mesenchymal. Later, with additional analysis, it was proneural neural classical in mesenchymal. Then even more recently, it was based on methylation profiles shown here. And now, we'll go over it in a moment, it is now based primarily on uh, mutational analysis and we'll go over the WHO classification. The fifth 2021 WHO classification of CNA tumors incorporates molecular markers into its diagnostic criteria. Under the 2021 revision, only three primary tumors remain in the type of diffuse gliomas in adults, termed adult type diffuse gliomas, namely astrocytoma IDH mutant, oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant 1P19Q codeleted, and glioblastoma IDH wild type, all of which are solely defined by the canonical molecular alterations regardless of morphological features. Astrocytoma IDH mutant this is showing an HNU revealing a moderate cellular neoplasm composed of infiltrating fibular neoplastic glial cells arranged in a vaguely microcytic background. The tumor cells express the mutant IDHR132H, this is the canonical uh, mutation, along with P53, shown by these arrowheads, but then they, they have lost uh, nuclear expression of ATRX shown in D. These are just other cells within the tumor microenvironment that have ATRX, but the tumor cells themselves have lost ATRX. Oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant, and 1P19Q codeleted is WHO grade 2 oligodendroglioma composed of infiltrating tumor cells with monoporific uh, round to oval nuclei with the paronuclear halos shown here in A. WHO grade 3 variants exhibit more dense cellular and proliferative activity and may contain microvascular proliferation shown here on, in uh, the B, as well as necrosis shown by arrowhead in green here. Glioblastoma, IDH wild type, with the classic glomeruloid microvascular proliferation. These tumors frequently inhibit, ex sorry, exhibit microvascular proliferation and pseudopalatine necrosis. Shown here is the diagnostic algorithm for integrating classifications of the major diffuse gliomas in adults. As you can see, the classification integrates histological tumor typing and grading, as well as analysis of molecular markers. There's a seven layered integrated diagnosis, as well as eight genomic and five protein signatures. But let's let it be noted that IDH and ATRX, as previously discussed, are the gatekeepers of this classification scheme. There's six facets of glioblastoma tumor microenvironment. We're gonna go over a couple of them, but I just wanna highlight what they are prior to going over um, some of them. So there's cell migration and invasion, cell proliferation and survival, angiogenesis, metabolic activity, immune modulation, and resistance to therapy, which could probably also be tied into what we talked at the very beginning with the initiation cells and glioma stem cells. Cancer cells are capable of reprogramming their metabolism in order to acquire survival adaptive changes via genetic or epigenetic alterations of metabolic related genes, for example, oncogene IDH. Mutant IDH1 cytoplasmic and IDH2 mitochondrial enzymes show a neomorphic enzymatic 
capability to convert alpha-ketoglutarate into 2-hydroxyglutarate, a small oncometabolite. The presence of mutant IDH1 or IDH2 proteins result in increased amounts of 2-HG, which then alters a number of downstream cellular activities. 2-HG competitively inhibits alpha-ketoglutarate from binding to several histone demethylases, including KDM2A, leading to a wide aberrant histone modification profile, particularly of histone tail methylation. This metabolite, 2-HG, also inhibits the TET1 and TET2 hydroxymethylases, decreasing the levels of 5-hydroxymethylcysteine. The epigenic dysregulation caused by the levels of 2-HG and alpha keto glutarate in IDH1 and IDH2 mutant cells may contribute to the aberrant regulation of gene expression in cancer. Finally, 2-HG also helps to stabilize HIF-1-alpha, particularly by decreasing the levels of HIF-1-alpha antagonist endostatin, which is results in increased VEGF signaling, a driver of increased angiogenesis in human cancers. Another process brought up earlier is invasion and migration. And as many surgeons already are aware, there's often tumor cells beyond what we can see with our visible eye. So the process of which this occurs is detachment from the um, primary tumor mass. This is, can be done by these different um, cleavage of CD44 or the cadherins. Then it then um, is sequentially adhe adhesion to the ECM. Um, at the point of ECM, and these are very similar, is that there's usually a degradation of the ECM by metalloproteinases 2 and 9. And then there's altered cell mobility and contractility where it's able to move through the ECM um, shown by this pathway here. Angiogenesis is a key event in the progression of malignant gliomas, as we discussed earlier with primary and secondary GBMs, as well as with the different um, classifications of an anaplastic astrocytoma and astrocytoma. For the diagnosis of GBM, microvascular pluration and necrosis are required. Blood vessel formation through angiogenesis is regulated by a balance between pro-angiogenic and anti-angiogenic molecules that mediates the angiogenic switch. Vascular endothelial growth factor, known as VEGF to most of us, is the main factor orchestrating glioma angiogenesis. When quiescent vessels sense angiogenic signals of VEGF, parasites detach from the vessel wall and liberate themselves through the basement membrane through the actions of of metalloproteinases, which is MMPs, if I didn't mention that earlier. VEGF increases vascular permeability, leading to ex extravasation of plasma proteins and deposition of proangiogenic matrix proteins. Endothelial cells migrate onto the matrix in response to VEGF and other proangiogenic cytokines and assemble themselves into eventually forming a mature vessel. Hypoxia is the most potent activator of angiogenic mechanisms in brain tumors, and it's its potent stimulator of HIF-1-alpha, which enhances veg expression as there is a HIF-1-alpha binding site within the VEGF promoter. There are other factors besides VEGF that stimulate angiogenesis in GBM, such as PDGF, FGF, angiopentin-1, angiopentin-2, DLL-4, integrins IL-8, and STF-1. Proangiogenic mediators are composed by actions of angiogenic factors such as endostatin, tumostatin, thrombospondins, angiostin, and interferons, as well as uh, tissue inhibitors of the MMPs themselves. When similar factors outweigh the inhibitory factors, the angiogenic switch turns on and leads to vessel formation. In terms of glermoid bodies formations, a possible mechanism is that there is an initiation of infiltrating glioma cells that co-ops pre-existing microvessels. But as the tumors grow, endothelial cells try to resist the co-option by releasing angio2, or ang2, excuse me, which leads to apoptosis of these cells in the absence of VEGF. Apoptosis of the endothelial cells then causes the tumor cells to become hypoxic and eventually necrotic, forming the initial foci of necrosis. This necrotic niche becomes surrounded by tumor cells forming the pattern of the 
pseudopalisadine necrosis. Pseudopalisine tumor cells upregulate their expression and secretion of VEGF, which acts on nearby endothelial cells, further promoting vascular proliferation and leading to the formation of the glerumoid structures that we see. I want to thank uh, the CNS for this opportunity to talk to you about glioma biology. I'm happy to answer any questions um, and um, looking forward to seeing you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.